Welcome to RC Video Magazine's Volume 6, 1986. In this, our second tape for this year, we will be taking you to the fourth annual Tropical Fun Fly in Costa Rica. A report on scale at the Nats. Part two, how to fly helicopters with Ed Nakasone. We've got more large scale from the QSAA. The Byron Originals Fun Fly in Ida Grove, Iowa. And we go back to 1932 to look at some vintage flying. RC Video Magazine honored an invitation this year to the fourth annual Tropical Fun Fly in Costa Rica, a small democratic country located between Panama and Nicaragua in Central America. We were fortunate enough to spend an entire week with our hosts, the Aereo Modelissimo Costa Rica, the only RC club in that country. The club has a beautiful 300-foot runway and shelter house at the Ciudad Hacienda Los Reyes Country Club just outside of the city of San Jose. We found ourselves amongst a talented group of modelers from all over the United States, Central America, and even as far away as Germany. The Tropical Fun Fly annually has attracted thousands of Costa Rican spectators. The participants in the Fun Fly spent several days touring the country and tuning up their planes for the show on Sunday. A wide variety of aircraft were represented. windbag is brought in from uh, Europe. It was originally designed in Europe. It, uh, the principle of it is the uh, wind inflates the bag, creates an airfoil, and as the windbag moves forward, it flies. And, uh, it's a very simple type situation. It's, uh, it's a novelty. It's something that people will sure like it. Is it easy to fly? 
It's very easy to fly, as you will see. I'm sure you'll take some pictures of it. And uh, it's a very, very easy to fly uh, airplane. Who's it distributed by here in the United States? Is this the, the company that uh, brings it in, uh, the product's called Texon. They introduce it in here, and it's distributed by Pan American International in Miami, Miami, Florida. I see we've got a good bit of wind here today, uh, maybe 10 to 15 miles an hour. Do you think that's too much wind to fly the parafoil? No, no, it'll fly. It's probably helpful because I'll keep that wing, uh, that bag, uh, inflated. <laughs> it's gonna go. It's gonna go pretty fast downwind, isn't it? Yes, it will. Yes, it will. <laughs> Definitely will. Okay. What What's it powered with? Uh, this particular one is powered by OS Max uh, 50 FSR, which uh, is a little bit of uh, overpower. It will fly with a 45. Aside from enjoying the flying at the airfield, we had the opportunity to take a few days and enjoy the lush tropical countryside of Costa Rica. The primary economic base of the nation is agriculture, with coffee as the leading export. Here are some of the coffee plantations that dot the countryside. All of the coffee is hand-picked, with one worker able to pick 30 to 40 pounds of beans per day. On the bus tour provided by our host, we stopped in at an ox cart factory providing us with a glimpse of their craftsmanship, unchanged for centuries. Okay, we're talking with Dennis Hunt. Dennis, how did you end up coming to Costa Rica? Well, that's a very, very uh, the latest uh, invitation from Julio Pastora. We talked about it a couple of years ago when I first came to America from Zimbabwe, and he invited me down here uh, and extended the invitation again this year, and I'm, I've really enjoyed it. It's a tremendous place, beautiful country. Dennis uh, produces, a, or he's from Zimbabwe Model Products, is that correct? Zimbabwe Model Products, that's right. We're not new in the business, you know. Zimbabwe Model Products started first producing kits nearly 20 years ago. But uh, we just arrived in America and now marketing our line here. Um, he's brought some beautiful models here. Maybe you could tell us a little bit what, what you have with well, us. Well, uh, I'm, I'm showing here three of our, our new models. The very latest model we have uh, is the, uh, the Chipmunker, of course. It's a very nice pattern airplane. It really is a super flying model. And, and it looks good. Uh, we've also brought down the Gator Flea. What we decided was we needed some airplanes perhaps that were better known. Some of the names of the airplanes that we produce are not known to the American uh, modeling public. So uh, we made arrangements to produce in our almost ready to fly format, you know, the pre-assembled fuselages and foam wings, uh, veneered and that sort of thing, uh, some American designs. Like the Gator Flea, the Gator Flea is an old uh, Southern RC airplane and we've made arrangements to produce that. And I've got the witch, of course, which uh, is our, you know, is, is a fun, just a fun thing. And it, and it flies, it just flies great. Dennis, Dennis was telling me earlier a story about how to catch a witch. Maybe you could well, uh, tell us. I, of course, I was prompted to tell you that story because the, the witch attacked me when uh, <laughs> I was being assisted by Don Lowe. And I made the mistake of running into the witch. Uh, there's a, way, a set way to catch a witch, and that is that uh, you wait until the witch has just passed you, and then you run in from the side and pluck it out of the air. So, 
And I, I hope we'll be able to show you that too just now. And uh, we have Dave Robinson helping us. Okay. And he's athletic. He can, get, he can reach in there and grab it. Okay, this is the group, the Lufthansa from Germany. Um, can, where, where is that located? Germany is located in Europe. I know. Where the group, where's the group? Uh, the group is from Frankfurt. Okay. Frankfurt, and uh, we belong to Lufthansa German Airlines. And it's the first time that we're here in Costa Rica. So this is a fun flight, and we enjoy the session very much. <laughs> okay, so you're all employees of Lufthansa? Yes, we are all employees of Lufthansa. We've been watching a lot of your um, shuttle aircraft flying these uh, gliders, pulling gliders. Uh, I'd like to learn a little bit more how you worked this out, um, how this plane was developed. Uh, that's a different question. The first, if we start with gliders, we try to shut the gliders up with a rubber, with a catapult, you see? And then sometimes you don't get the real altitude. And so we get the idea to put the glider on the top of a shuttle aircraft to get higher altitude and find out also better areas where are good winds. <laughs> you see, it's a prototype, it's no kit. It's developed by Reinhold Dreme. The aircraft is nearly flying 15 years, he told me. <laughs> has up to 500 shuttles now, yeah. Reinhold. Yeah, he told 500 shuttles. You hoisted 500 gliders yes. airborne with this. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, can we find out a little bit about how it works? How it's a very a simple system. You see, we have a hookup on a normal uh, aircraft. And then you fix a glider with two rubbers on the right and on the left wing. May I demonstrate it to you? Please. They have a servo mounted inside. And this, when the servo releases a pin, there's a fork. And this fork is, is pulled up on the two sets of horns that are held in place by rubber bands. In other words, when the servo releases it, the rubber bands just release the plane. The glider, because of its extra lift, pulls away from the power plane. It works flawlessly. speaking with David Robertson from California Model Imports and KG Helicopters. And he's brought a Hughes 300, which we'll, we're watching fly. Uh, can you, Dave, tell us a little bit about this uh, craft. Well, what we have is a uh, gasoline-powered, weed eater-powered helicopter. It uses a 1.3 cubic inch gasoline engine. Okay. Uh, does that mean that it's, a, it's an engine from a weed eater? It actually is, with some modifications, yes. Okay. But the basic mechanics is extremely strong. There's no plastic in the drivetrain anywhere to like stripping gears and this kind of thing. So it makes an ideal trainer and, and, and a good sports ship. Um, what else about the helicopter can you tell us about? The entire mechanics is an I-beam construction so that in normal crashing situations, the only thing you're really going to hurt are the peripheral things such as blades, tail boom, rotor blades, and the, the canopy. Great. Well, thank you, Dave. That's a California model import.
Okay, we're talking with somebody who doesn't even need an introduction, I don't think, uh, Don Lowe. Don, how did you happen to come to Costa Rica? Well, Julio Pastora invited me to come down uh, last year, and we came down for the fun fly, and in August, we came down to a special Carl Goldberg memorial uh, event they had. And the country's so beautiful, they invited us to come back, so here we are again. Okay, I notice you have a, a gyrocopter here. This is a cute little unit. Can you tell us about that? Well, this strange animal is uh, imported from uh, England. It's a Wallace semi-scale copy, and it's marketed by Texan, uh, Pan American Hobbies in uh, Miami, Florida. And uh, I got interested in this thing because I've been I've done a little bit of full-scale autogyro flying, and, and they're kind of strange animals, and I wanted to see if this thing is anything like it. Yeah, and it's, it's a little strange, but it's not all that difficult to fly. It. Don, how does this uh, fun fly compare to other ones you've been to? I would say uh, the ones that I've attended, and I've been to several in different parts of the world, and of course in the U.S., uh, it's about second in terms of size, in terms uh, size, of course, referring to the crowd. Uh, they have plenty of flyers and aircraft here, and part of the problem, of course, is getting it all in. But... Oh, wow. Eric brought the uh, string box, the beautiful string box that we saw. Um, he had his initial flight and had a little bit of trouble. Could you yeah. tell us what happened? On this uh, edge, the wind come up on uh, lifting up on stolen. And I had no more chance uh, for this slowly flying airplane yes. to do something. I tried, there was nothing what to do. I, was re 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 I can repair it. Good, it can be rebuilt. We we're, were hoping yes, that I could be. it could be. 75 percent is okay. There's a lot of turbulence on this, on this corner there, and they're lifting up in the moment, and then the speed go down when I stall. Okay. All right. Well, we'll be, I hope to see it again someday in one oh, piece. I think next year. Okay. Or in the States somewhere. No? Yeah. The fourth annual Tropical Fun Fly had something to offer everyone. The still active Irazu volcano and State Park is only a short trip in the cool mountains from San Jose. In Costa Rica, model airplane flying is a very popular spectator sport. Thousands turned out for an afternoon of flying. The media coverage was impressive with the local press on hand as well as live multi-camera TV coverage from a local station. Texon Precision Products and many other manufacturers donated great models as prizes for the participants and top finishers. We met and talked with a group from Panama. There were seven flyers, assorted friends, and several model clubs represented. 
They made the 17-hour journey with 16 airplanes via the Pan American Highway just to be present at the event. Seems no one wanted to pass up the opportunity to meet with some of the well-known pilots visiting their part of the world. The organizer of the event, Julio Pastora, seen here with his laser, is also the president of the Aereo Modelissimo Costa Rica Club. He sincerely extends his appreciation to those attending the fun fly and wishes a warm welcome to anyone that wants to visit this fascinating and friendly country. There is no better way to spend a vacation than flying and touring the beautiful country of Costa Rica. Somebody comes down here, they're hooked and they keep returning. That seems to be the trend and we certainly enjoy that. Great. Well, we certainly enjoyed our stay here. We're looking forward to coming back next year to cover this event for as long as it goes on, I hope. Well, I hope you come every month. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Hugh. Hazel Sig's Clipped Wing Cub, America's all-time favorite plane. Build this beautiful model of a truly outstanding airplane. This highly aerobatic plane is really a joy to fly. It is as smooth, stable, and responsive as the big one, and basic aerobatic maneuvers such as loops, rolls, spins, and snaps are easy. The Morrissey Bravo, copied at quarter scale in the quality SIG tradition. Everyone who has flown this Bravo remarks about the easygoing and smooth flying characteristics. The model is stable, forgiving, and can give a good account of itself in aerobatics. It'll get you into faster company without scaring you to death in the process. The new cadet senior, known as the hands-off trainer, flies along so slowly and gently that just about anyone can handle it. Even experts get a big charge out of the unique qualities of the cadet senior. For those of you who already have the fine SIG products, take the video tour of SIG and see what makes SIG unique in the model industry. This is our third and final report on the 1985 Nats. We are now preparing for the 1986 Nats in Lake Charles, Louisiana. If you don't already know it, this is the 50th anniversary of the Nats. The dates are July 24 through August 2nd, 1986. A half century of competing and sharing model aviation makes this a very special Nats. This is a 1941 Waco VKS-7F. It's one of 30 aircraft that were originally built for the Army Air Corps for cross-country flight training. The aircraft is equipped with flaps in the lower surface of the top wing. The full-size airplane is located in Findlay, Ohio, and is owned by Mr. Vincent Mariani, who has taken four EAA Best of Show awards with his aircraft. This is a scratch-built model from my own plans and patterns, including the cowl and wheel pants. It is built of balsa ply, has an OS-90 four-cycle engine swinging a 16.5 propeller. It has a wingspan of 74.6 inches. The scale is 2.25 inches to the foot. It is covered with coverall painted with a mixture of SIG and Randolph dopes. It has 1,295 actual flying inches of wing area. It weighs 13 and one half pounds. Took somewhere more than 1,000 hours to construct. Let me get your name. I'm Charlie Nelson, and I'm a representative of the Central Mass RC Modelers, a club here in eastern Massachusetts, of which I'm the president. 
Although this aircraft is, is uh, hand-drawn by me, when I had my plans almost done in my mail one day, Norman Rosenstock, who knows I like Wacos, had sent me a set of plans in this same scale, two and a quarter inches to the foot. And if anyone needs plans for a very similar aircraft, contact Norm Rosenstock in Long Island, New York. Uh, this is a Mariner. It's called a PBM-3, used in World War II uh, by Navy pilots. For uh, They would uh, rescue uh, pilots from the oceans and also uh, survey for uh, submarines, submarine patrol. Okay. Um, tell us a little bit about the construction of this aircraft. Okay, this is entirely out of styrofoam, and the... The hull is covered with fiberglass, and the wings are sheeted with balsa over foam. It's literally, literally carved out of styrofoam covered with fiberglass, the body and the tails. What type of power plants do you have here? Well, I uh, found out that I finally found out with uh, Super Tiger 75 snurls to do an adequate job for it. And uh, as a booster for the last couple of years, out of the last 11, uh, I'm using uh, rockets for boosters, which adds to uh, a little bit of more touch to the takeoff climb. What's your name? John Nicolacci. Nine channels using nine servos and uh, it has follow flaps, freeze ailerons, um, JADO uh, control, and I have two servos, one for both engines and another servo for taxiing, which will increase the speed of one engine and decrease the other for taxiing, just like the real one. It had no rudder, no sub-rudder on it. Okay, we're talking with Henry Hafke, and we're going to ask him a little bit about his GB here. Um, Henry, why don't you give us a little bit of background on, on your relationship with this aircraft? All right. Uh, I was born here in Springfield and grew up in Chicopee Falls, just a short distance from the Springfield Airport back in the early 1930s. And uh, I used to go over the airport and watch these airplanes fly in the evening. Uh, I was too young, really, to appreciate what was going on. To me, they were just airplanes. They had wings and a propeller, and they flew and so forth. But uh, uh, I have always been interested in racing planes, and uh, about 12 years ago, I decided to build a model of one of the GBs, which there was very little information on model-wise. 
And uh, the first model that I built uh, turned out to be the best flying model I had ever built. And it was actually a model of the aircraft that flew out of here this morning, the real Model Y. And uh, I got to know some of the Granville people and uh, kept building GBs. That's just about all I've done for the last 10 years. This one here is uh, one of the most uh, well-known of the GBs. It was the racer that Jimmy Doolittle won the 1932 Thompson Trophy race with and also set a world speed record in this aircraft. And uh, it's just gotten a terrible reputation over the years uh, because of the bad writings that writers have done, which is completely unfounded. And uh, I'm getting ready to write a book on them, which is going to tell for the first time the true story of these airplanes and the men that beat them, uh, that built them. And it's really not that difficult to fly. It's, uh, it's a little tricky on the ground, but uh, it flies in the air. It flies as well as any other big airplane does. It's uh, scratch built. I designed this about uh, four and a half years ago and uh, built it. And uh, we've been flying it regularly at contests and just out to the field for fun every once in a while. And it flies very well. It weighs 15 pounds and is powered by a Weber 90. It's all balsa and little plywood construction and uh, I have the plans available for it, and uh, I've also done the plans in quarter scale, which is a little bigger than this. Previously, I had built a smaller one with a 56-inch uh, wingspan, and at that wingspan, the airplane was just too small to be practical. It, you couldn't build it without having too heavy a wing loading. This one here at 15 pounds, the wing loading figures out to be around 35 ounces, which is, is very acceptable for a, for a big airplane. What is it powered with? It's powered with a, a Weber 91 speed and I fly it on a uh, rev up uh, 16 four and a half propeller and I might also say that the Weber uh, has a Martin Industries carburetor on it which is the carburetor that really makes the Weber, uh, Weber run. This beautiful GBY model was built by Ken Flagler. This model has one slight difference from the models competing this year at the Nats. It's flown from the inside instead of by radio. We caught up with Ken moments before he climbed in the incredibly detailed cockpit and flew off into the clear New England sunrise. Well, Ken, I can't tell you how thrilled we are that you managed to fly all the way out here seven hours just to show this thing off at the Nats. And uh, it's a real kick to have the airplane that everybody's wearing on their shirts and hats and jackets <laughs> come flying in. So uh, you had quite a trip out here. Uh, to, and you spent six years building this airplane. Seven and a half years building it. And uh, it was a thrill for us to come out here. We, had, we decided to make it an ad adventure when you fly an airplane like this. Uh, it's, it's an adventure. We landed three times for gas. Well, seven hours and 15 minutes, we fly out of Kenosha Airport in Wisconsin. And uh, we've had a great trip, and we've had just a super time out here. The airplane. Uh, well, we're thrilled to have you. You've been a model, you've been an AMA member for a long time, haven't you? Yeah, I joined the AMA in 43, and uh, flew my first NATS in 46 at Wichita, so this is not new to me. I've flown other NATS. But well, we can sure see a lot of model building experience in the job you did on this airplane. You, you told me before that you like to show this thing off to modelers almost as much as to people who own their own airplanes. Yeah, that's true. More so, actually, the modelers appreciate it more because they look at it and they can see the innards of it And when they look at it. And a lot of power pilots, which are appreciative of the, what it looks like on the outside, don't really understand what they're looking at on the inside. So the modelers are more appreciative of it. And it's more fun to have it here than... Well, pardon the expression, Oshkosh. <laughs> <laughs>
Here is Bob Fiorenzi standing way out on a field holding his arm in the air. Thanks, Bob. We just couldn't resist getting this shot. We're going to talk to Bob and his incredible F-4. Bob, tell us a little bit about your aircraft. Okay, it's a Tom Cook kit, Jet Model Products. It's powered by two uh, KMB 7.5s, 7 that's 45 uh, cubic inches. It has the Tom Cook retracts, uh, craft radio, uh, and it's finished with uh, acrylic lacquer, car paint. What fan units did you use in this? It's the Turbax 1 with the, uh, like I said, the KMB 7.5. Are they stock 7.5s? Uh, no, they're modified by Tom. They have uh, OS7 DV carburetors, and uh, the pumps are off the back, and they have, uh, I believe, they're 6.5 back plates. And uh, the, uh, there's a few extra head shims under the head for uh, less compression, and we're running 25% SIG fuel. I see. Uh, um, let's go over some more of the functions that you have on this jet. Okay, we have two servos for the throttles. We have one servo for the steering. We have one servo for the aileron. One for the flying stab. Hey, Bob, how long did it take to build this aircraft? Okay, uh, a few hours a night. We're talking about six months, and uh, almost every night. <laughs> oh, Bob, you've d it's more than a scale aircraft. You fly it very scale. Uh, is there some trick to that, making a plane look real in the sky, more than just building a scale aircraft? Well, it's. Uh, no, I like to think it's all me. I'm, it's not. It's basically the design of the airplane and characteristics of the full scale and uh, it is a large platform of an airplane to fly it's, uh, it's not a small airplane and uh, once it's trimmed properly it just grooves along and it's not hard to fly at all how did you do in the static score okay static we did uh, 93 and uh, the two flight scores that they used was uh, 90.33 and 94.33. That should put you in a real good standing then. Uh, yeah, I believe we're in first place right now. In, in which ca category? This would be uh, expert sports scale. This is a de Havilland 86B, and it's uh, commonly known as the Express Airliner. Okay, it was uh, built uh, back in 1926, the original was built, and it was used between the wars as a long-distance passenger carrying aircraft. Okay, and, and this aircraft was scratch-built by you? Yes, I uh, took whatever drawings I could find, which are kind of scarce, of the original, and uh, drew up my own plans and, and built the model from scratch. I had in mind a Rapide originally, which is a twin-engine, uh, smaller version of this aircraft, but a lot of others had already been built of the Rapide, and I thought, well, I'd try some for something unique. And then also, uh, I built it for FAI competition, so I wanted to take advantage of the rules and uh, get the maximum bonus points. And when I saw this airplane, I figured that's got to be the one. Okay. Could, maybe you could point out some of the reasons why this is a, uh, a better aircraft to build for FAI rules. Well, in FAI rules, of course, the bonus points are uh, run as such. I have four engines, so that gives me 20% right off the bat. 
I have a biplane with under camber, which gives me another 10%. That makes it 30%. And I have an additional 5% because it's a tail dragger. Okay. That's a total of 35%, and that's uh, just about the most I can figure of any airplane you could choose. Um, do you know how your sc score is holding up right now? Well, as far as I know, I'm on top. I don't know the spread, but uh, with the bonus points, uh, it's going to be tough for the other fellows to catch me. And I think partially because of my model and some of the others that have been built along those those new rules, uh, they're probably going to be reverting back to a less generous bonus point system. So you'll see that, uh, uh, the simpler models having a better chance, which they really should. Well, the power is uh, four OS 20 RC plane bearing engines. And the only modifications I've made is to make them a radial mount. I've built my own mufflers so they'll fit inside the cowlings. And I've added an OS four cycle plug, which really helps the idle at uh, low speed. And I've um, added a little nitro to the fuel. I'm running about 12% nitro. OK, any, anything else about the construction of this that you might want to tell us, um, what it's basically made out of? Yeah, it's nothing too unique. It's uh, basically a balsa framework structure with some pine in for stiffening. I've uh, vacuum for formed uh, styrene nacelles and cowlings. And uh, I've also uh, covered the airplane in silk span paper and then used butyrate dope on that uh, for the finish. The whole idea was to keep it really light because in the rules the maximum weight allowed is six kilograms which is 13.2 pounds so it had to be kept light to make a plane this large. What is the weight? Uh, the word weight is 13.2 pounds because uh, <laughs> when I weighed in originally with the plane, it was a little over, so I scratched a little weight out, a couple grams, and it's right dead on, maybe a couple under. That's about where I sit. What's your name? Steve Gray. You're from? Kitchener, Ontario. Steve Gray won top honors in FAI for his de Havilland Rapid Express. Bob Fiorenzi won first place in expert class with his F4J ducted fan. In giant scale, Ramon Torres won first place for his Beechcraft T-34. When we conclude the Nats here at Westover, we'll be packing up our equipment and shipping it down to Lake Charles, Louisiana, where the Nats will be next year at about this same time. That'll be a 50th anniversary of the Academy, and we hope to have the biggest Nats ever. Avid hobbyists always have something up their sleeves. With Zap Glues, any modeler can work magic. Slow Zap allows 30 to 40 seconds positioning time and produces very strong joints in hardwoods and plywoods. Flex Zap is the strongest adhesive made for the hobby industry, achieving maximum results without an accelerator. Zap. The total adhesive system works like magic. Welcome to phase two of RC Video Magazine series on beginning helicopter. At this time, some of you out there may be wanting to throw rocks at me because you can't get into a basic hover. For you, I say keep practicing those exercises. It will come by eventually. For those of you who have maintained a steady hover, I congratulate you, but don't forget Keep your eye on the fuel bottle. It gets low very quickly. In this series, we will be covering four basic exercises. The first one being the horizontal eight, nose pointed into the wind. The horizontal eight, nose pointed into the direction of flight. The circle hover around the pilot, both left turn and right turn. Then I'm also introducing the nose in hover at this time. Before we begin, I'd like to ask, uh, answer several questions that were brought to me from the previous uh, uh, series. And that is why did I go into a forward movement or left and right movement before trying to hover? I feel strongly at this point that for you to gain control of the aircraft is very important. Whereby if you go into a hover mode, you'll find that you are not really gaining control of the aircraft. That is, if it moves forward, you're pulling back to stop it. If it goes to the left, you're pulling to the right to stop it in that direction. In other words, you're behind the eight ball all the way through. So go ahead and do those exercises and you feel, you'll find that the hover exercises will be much easier from there. To help with the description on the, this uh, exercises for today, I have my model aircraft which will demonstrate to you what we'll be accomplishing. As I indicated, the first exercise is a controlled movement exercise which is the horizontal eight nose pointing to the wind. What we basically will do is 
The pilot is approximately five to eight feet in the back of the chopper. What we'll do, the wind is in this direction here. We'll get the aircraft into a, approximately a two to three feet hover. We'll move forward and start moving the aircraft to the left and to the back, doing a circle to the left. We'll come up, forward, stop, land, take a breather, get up into a hover. Now we'll start moving to the right here. Come on back to the center, stop, land, take a breather. Oh yeah, here we go. Steady hover, two to three feet. Okay, get it over your reference point. Now again, the idea is we'll go very slowly forward. Now to your left slightly. There you go, very slowly now. Come on back, make a nice little circle. Very slowly, very slowly. Nose into the wind. Give it a little right, give it a little right. Okay, let's go over back to our reference point. Okay, hover it, stop it. Come down, let's take a break there, okay? Now we'll get it back up into a hover. Continue forward. Now slightly to your right. Give it a little right here. Okay, get it on back. Keep it coming, nose into the wind. Give it a little left. Okay, again. Get into it. Stop it. Land, take a breather. And we'll, be, we'll get back up to a hover. And this time, rather than stopping, we'll continue on with a basic figure eight. Nose into the wind, just as I'm pointing out right now. Get it up in the hover. Very slowly, now to your left. Forward, very slowly, nose into the wind. Oh, coming back. Slowly, slowly. This time, as I come around my reference point, I will not stop. I will continue on with the figure eight. That's exactly what I want you to do. Continue in this exercise, just as you see it now. Nose into the wind, very slowly. Again, the purpose behind this is to get a good control touch feeling on the aircraft where you have total control. I want you to continue the exercise until you feel very comfortable with it. For the horizontal eight, nose pointing to the direction of flight, we'll do basically get you, again, same thing, five to eight feet in front of the pilot, get to a two to three foot hover, move to the right, five feet away, stop, move to the left, nose into the wind, move to the left, approximately five foot away, stop, Basically, what we're trying to do is get you to point the aircraft in this direction here and flying, coming back, and doing a figure eight. At the same time, having the aircraft 90 degrees in front of the pilot. Two to three feet hover. Remember, we started this exercise last time, going to the right, keep the nose into the wind, stop at about approximately five to eight feet. Now let's go to the left. Keep practicing the exercise until you stabilize very slow and easy. Okay, stop it. Now as we go, we're going to go back to the right. Don't stop over your reference point. Gradually put in a little tail rotor control, facing the nose into the wind here. Push it forward. Okay, stop it. Turn the nose into the wind. Let's go to the left again. Okay, gradually induce some. The idea is let the aircraft run sideways to 90 degrees to you. We'll stop it. Point the nose into the wind. Okay, gradually now point the nose into the direction of flight, slow and easy. Okay, stop it if necessary. Point the nose into the wind. Go to your left. Gradually induce forward flight. Now at this point, we want to just continuously go around without stopping. Point the nose into the wind. And notice what we're trying to accomplish here. I'm pointing the nose into the direction of wind and continuously doing a figure eight, slow and easy. Aircraft is flying 90 degrees to you. Bring it around. Okay, continue to slow figure eight. And that's what you're actually trying to accomplish here. You get tired, let's get back to a basic hover. Point the nose into the wind. Stop over our reference point again. For the circle around the pilot, what we'll, what we'll essentially do, the pilot is up here, again, approximately five to eight feet. Get the aircraft into a two to three feet hover. Now the pilot himself will turn to the left at this time. Then gradually turning the aircraft to the left, moving it forward and making a basic circle around him, a left hand circle. Okay, stopping it, pointing into the wind again. 
Now the pilot this time turns to the right. Aircraft points to the right. He makes a right-hand turn around him. Do the same thing, coming around, stopping it, facing the aircraft into wind and land. Okay, we want to do this very slowly, as I indicated, two to three feet hover. Now I want you to gradually turn your body, then simultaneously, slowly, turn the aircraft to your left and go forward just slowly. This is a left circle hover, very slowly. Again, control touch, but the attempt here is to get the aircraft pointing 90 degrees to you or sideways. Keep going forward very slowly. Keep doing this aircraft very slowly. Okay, very slowly. As you come over to your reference point, stop. Turn it into the wind. Now at this stage, come down and rest if necessary. In my case, I have to because I got the cord tangled around me. So let's go back to the right to untangle the cord. Get it up into a hover. Turn your body to the right. Turn the aircraft to your right and start the slow hover. Okay, give a little tail rotor, forward movement, little tail. Remember, it's easier to go to your left than it is to your right, but you've got to keep a constant balance, constant balance around you. Keep it a small circle, slow and easy, very slow and easy. Again, it's coordination, and everything is driven from that. As you get the reference, keep it going around, and back into the wind. Once you finish that, up to a landing. Okay, again, the point is continue doing this exercise, not only the left side, which is easier, but also force yourself to go around the, to the right. And as far as the nose-in hover, which everybody hates to do, basically, pilot again is about approximately five feet in the back, get the aircraft in a solid hover. If you have not reached a solid hover state, please do not attempt this exercise. You need to get in a solid hover. The pilot will walk around the side of the aircraft. If he feels uncomfortable, he can walk back, but ultimately he'll walk in the side, in the front, and generally in the front of the aircraft with the nose pointed to the pilot. Then he'll do that both for the left and the right, then land the aircraft. Don't forget, you must accomplish a good solid hover before you do this exercise. Now from here, as I indicated, I'm gonna start from the left, but work on both sides. Gradually start walking up to the aircraft, looking into the direction of flight. Keep the aircraft going. From this point, after this, turn sideways to the helicopter. If you get disoriented, turn into the direction of wind, walk backwards again. Keep working it in this configuration until you come up to the 45 degree point. At this point, there's a mental transition that goes through flying this nose-in hover here. You get Lift over it, walk sideways, or continue on. And this is where I call my transition point, right here. It's a very mental process, but don't worry about it until you come in to the basic nose and hover in this direction here. Get into trouble, land the helicopter. So again, the main point, get into a hover, solid hover, stand with a position that you're comfortable with, and again, Solid hover again, gradually. Keep it into that hover. Try to look into it if you have to. Remember I said, the wind's building up here, but keep the wind going. And this is your 90 degree changeover point. And that's exactly how to get into a basic nose-in hover here. So keep practicing this. And you should not be afraid because everything will be taking place for our next phase. Speaking of our next phase, let me give you a quick preview of what's going to be taking place. Let's get the aircraft into a hover. Now you should be good at this. And gradually what we're going to do is start our forward flight. Very slow and easy, right into the wind. We'll turn. Turn downwind. There we go. We are flying away. Okay, remember the, your simple figure eight that you've been practicing? That's what we'll be doing. Get in the aircraft and gradually coming back for a regular landing. 
Very slow and easy. Very slow and easy. So you can see why it's very important. So until the next time, I want to say keep practicing those exercises and we'll get good things coming about to work on for the next phase. Until then, don't forget to break a blade. McDaniel RC presents the revolutionary Nice Starter, pocket size power for starting your standard glow engines. The Nice Starter is safe and convenient. The unique headlock keeps the Nice Starter on the plug, not in the propeller. And you can get 50 starts from one 16 hour charge. Now McDaniel offers an improved model of the Nice Starter. The addition of a soldered reinforcing ring at the tip helps prevent stripping out the headlock, providing you with a longer lasting tool. Remember, the Nice Starter is not a wrench, and if used as one, will strip out the headlock. For more information on the Nice Starter and other McDaniel RC products, see your local RC dealer. We're back again under the clear skies of Las Vegas for the Quarter Scale Association of America's annual fly-in. In our last issue, we talked to George Vogelsang with his Wright Flyer and George Harlan described his British Mosquito. In this program, we have five more modelers who took time to share with us their quarter scale achievements. Okay, we're speaking with Noel Hess and his beautiful Goshawk, I believe. Is that what this is? Curtis Goshawk of the number F-11C-2. It's a uh, Navy fighter plane of the 1932-34 issue. And this was a model of a plane that flew off the carrier Saratoga. It's a uh, quarter scale, eight foot wingspan, weighs about 40 pounds, has a Kawasaki 3.15 engine. It's covered with seconite and painted with beauty rate dope and acrylic lacquer. Has uh, eight flights on it to date. Today's been the best one for him. <laughs> is this uh, something from your own drawings, or did you uh, purchase this from someone else? No, I purchased commercial drawings, and then it's scratch built from those. Uh, I modified them, of course. You never build one, of course, in somebody else's design exactly. You use their basic design and then modify it to your needs. So it's a little bit different than some of them. Who's your test pilot? Uh, the pilot, the man that flies it for me, is named Noel Johnson from Leighton, Utah, and he's a flight engineer for United. And he's a very good pilot. Uh, he's a man I'd trust with anything I could build. Well, it sure is a beautiful aircraft. Uh, what else do you have on the drawing board? Anything new coming along? Well, I've started one for next year that's called a Curtis Condor. It's a biplane, a uh, transport biplane with twin engines and retractable landing gear. One that was used about the same time as this one by American Airlines back east for transport. I got started on it, but I could see I couldn't finish it this year, so I put it on the hold and I'll work on it this winter. Well, we'll surely be looking forward to that one next year. Try and have it here. Thanks a lot, Noel. Thank you. My name is Nick Rivaldo. Okay, Nick. Um, what, what aircraft is this? This is the OV-10 Bronco A. Uh, it's a reconnaissance aircraft made by North American Rockwell. Okay. Where did you get the idea to do a model of this one? Two years ago, we were flying out here, and one of these things came over the field. I thought it was a flying boxcar, and it uh, looked pretty interesting. So one of the other fellows said, no, it's a Bronco. I'll send you all the literature. And he did, and it was so ugly and so neat that I thought I'd go ahead and be different and build it. Okay. okay, tell us a little bit about um, how you put it together, what it's made out of, some engines, information, and radios. Sure. Uh, basically, it's foam and balsa wood. There's no spruce used in it. It's got plywood doublers. The wings, the flying feathers are all foam core with balsa sheeted, fiberglass, and acrylic, enam uh, acrylic enamel. The engines are powered... Are Sax 3.7. I originally had the uh, 2.3 Cobras, but I felt it wasn't enough power. So I put these two engines in. It's been flying great. It's got two complete different radio systems in the airplane, uh, flying from one transmitter. If one system fails, hopefully I've got about a 30% chance of saving the airplane. 
It weighs about uh, 55 pounds. It, I've got about 1,500 hours in it, two years off and on. It took me about three or four months just to decide how I was going to build it. Did you use original drawings? Yes. I, uh, the friend of mine, he sent me a pilot's manual. So then I took the outline of the airplane. It had the dimensions. And I went ahead and blew them up on the wall in sections. And that's where I started. Very good. OK. We look forward to seeing it fly. OK. What's your name? Uh, Robert Shannon. Shannon. OK. Tell us a little bit about your cub. Well, it's a Balsa UFA kit. Uh, I built it approximately six and a half years ago. And it's been out here the last six years. I just recently redone it so it looked nice. I tried to get for a scale contest over in Riverside. And I did pretty good over there, uh, considering my. OK, tell us about the teddy bear. Well, the teddy bear, what would happen, I used to be a garbage hauler. And one morning, I went up to pick, pick a can up to dump it into the truck. And when it did, uh, the bear fell out and hit me and scared the daylights out of me. And of course, I just built the cub and I figured, ha ha, that go good with my cub. So I, uh, I put the cub in. It's been in the, every flight since. It's, uh, in other words, I put it in about the sixth flight of the airplane. It's been in ever since. And uh, it's got a, uh, well over 600 flights on it now, today. Great. OK. Well, we'll look forward to seeing that thing fly again. OK. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks a lot. Sir. This is Mel Barber. We spoke with him last year. He brought the beautiful DC-3. This year he brought the Sikorsky. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Good morning. Yes, the Sikorsky S-39CS is the aircraft that Martin Oza Johnson toured Africa in 1932. Uh, I was looking for a subject for Vegas, something that could break down into a small parcel for transport from South Africa. And uh, I saw the elephant, the S-38, which was a very big, ugly two-engine airplane. But it was the ideal subject to break down for transportation. And um, I was getting, collecting material for this aircraft when somebody told me that Tsiolkovsky had built a smaller version of the airplane and that they specifically built one called the Spirit of Africa for the Johnsons. And I started searching for information, and uh, I eventually got hold of Paul Armat of Historical Aviation Album, who sent me all the particulars. The aircraft's called the Spirit of Africa, and I think, thought it was very, very ideal for the type of aircraft that I could build and bring to Vegas for the quarter scale do. Um, I got hold of Paul Armat's book, and uh, I planned the airplane so that I could strip it. Um, all the brake joints are as per production joints on the full-size airplane. I um, made transparencies of the three views uh, D4 size in the book, blew it up against a wall to the scale I wanted. Um, the aircraft is one-fifth scale. It worked out to ideal proportions, giving me a wingspan of 10 foot 6. The construction of the airplane is as per the full size. Every rib is in the same position. The hinges are scale. Um, if you notice the covering on, on, on the wing here, most people ask me why didn't I just put a full sheet here? But the full size had the gaps as per the model. And all the center section, the wing panels, the construction of the fuselage, everything is scale. Uh, the fuselage is basically all ply. All the ribs are ply and it's covered with cover eye. The, the leading edge sheeting is also ply as per the original uh, prototype. Um, the aircraft has flown on a Quadra, but not yet on the nine-cylinder radial. I brought the nine-cylinder, uh, the aircraft to Vegas two years ago, or the nine-cylinder, but could not get it going. Was this aircraft, it looks like an exploration type of vehicle, it almost looks like a motorboat with a wing strapped onto it. When Martin Oza Johnson toured Africa uh, on the photographic exhibition, they thought they would make a color scheme that would relate to the tribesmen. And this is a giraffe color scheme. Because most of the natives in 1932 had never seen a white person, never mind an airplane. And they would run for miles if they saw the airplane, because it was something foreign to them. 
And this is why the Johnsons painted in this giraffe's color scheme to give them something to associate it with so that it, it, it wasn't all fear. And they actually captivated the tribes. And uh, when the aircraft used to come overhead and the Africans used to see it, they used to flock to the, to, to, to the, to the uh, lakes to come and meet the Johnsons. It was specially built uh, as a camera plane by Sarkovsky for the Johnsons and the color scheme was done by the Sarkovsky factory. The reason why I've persevered with this motor is that the scale of the original engine that was fitted to modern Oza Johnson's uh, aircraft worked out to uh, nine and eight inches and the scale on this one is exactly nine and eight inches. The motor fitted to the Johnson's aeroplane was Pratt & Whitney single wasp number two. This engine was loaned to Howard Hughes for racing attempts and he actually broke some world record racing uh, 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 um, records with it. When it was returned to uh, Pratt & Whitney, the Johnsons approached Pratt & Whitney and actually purchased the motor from Pratt & Whitney for $2,000 less than what I paid for this motor. Okay, we're speaking with Harry Apoyan. Is that correct? Okay. Um, definitely an unusual looking aircraft. Uh, so I want to find a little bit about it. Well, this airplane was uh, designed in 1916 and used in World War I as a, as a non-combat airplane because the British uh, government outlawed monoplanes. They said they're not safe. So it was relegated to peripheral type of duties, uh, reconnaissance and observation type of thing, uh, uh, training and so on. Uh, I'm not sure, but I think this was a training airplane. The reason they put the stripes on it is to make it more visible to the, uh, uh, to the people that were uh, in training. So it is a real airplane. It, it does, it did have these brown and white stripes, but, uh, and it flew very nice. It was pretty well advanced for its time. It's what is it? <laughs> <laughs> Bristol M1C, made by the Bristol Aircraft Company. They made, a lot of, they made a lot of fighter airplanes, and sometimes they call it the Bristol Bullet because of the shape of the fuselage, but it is the Bristol uh, monoplane. That's a common, common designation for it, M1C. Where did you get the inspiration for this project? The uh, airplane was built, uh, I built it quite a few years ago, like five or six, and uh, it got worn out to the point where I couldn't even fly it. I recovered it, and just on a lark, I thought, well, let's make it something different. Uh, rather, than, rather than put the Paisley pattern on it, I thought it would be nice <laughs> to put, make it look a little more realistic. But there is a picture of the airplane in the profile publication uh, booklet and uh, with a color, uh, color uh, artist rendition. So it's a very striking, but even to me it's striking because I couldn't, I couldn't believe it until I finished it and I saw what it was like. <laughs> very, very nice. And it flies very nice, very gentle flying airplane. So, okay. um, what's it powered with? It's, uh, it has a Super Target 2500 in it. The plane weighs 11 and a half pounds and uh, it has, it's a seven foot uh, wingspan, which is one quarter size. It, uh, uh, has nine square foot of wing area, so the wing loading is very light. In fact, it's any time, any kind of mild uh, winds, it starts uh, flying all over the sky. It just, of course, it's unstable, and uh, but nevertheless, it's. I really like it. It's a joy to fly. Okay, I noticed you built a lot of airplanes with big spinners. Is that uh, some no, reason I for think that? It just sort of uh, <laughs> that happened. The the uh, Fokker D8 uh, has a big cowling on it, which required a mold just like this spinner. The Polish fighter uh, has a big spinner, but I had that uh, turned on with aluminum. However, it's just coincidental. It had no, oh, yeah. no, no. Well, no, tell, no. I saw you with a trophy this morning. Tell me about that. Oh, the trophy was, uh, it was a complete surprise. It's a Waldo Pepper Award. It's like an Oscar for the nice guys, and I'm one of the nice guys. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, uh, what was surprising was uh, he read off, and now this fellow started in such and such a year, and he's been building airplanes, and he was in the Air Force, and, and he kept going on an instructor in the Air Force, and I kept listening more attentively until he said, He's the president of Chapter 3. And I said, well, geez, I'm the president of <laughs> Chapter 3. <laughs> so it was, a, it was a pleasant surprise. I really appreciate it. It's something that means a lot more than just winning a trophy. It's, it's something to cherish because they don't give very many out. And you have to be somebody special. Yeah. Well, Harry is definitely somebody special. Oh, thank you, Ken. <laughs> I appreciate that. That's okay. very nice. I like, I like the hobby. I have a lot of friends. And, and one reason you come out here, of course, is socialize and meet sure. people and meet your old friends that you haven't seen for a year. 
And uh, so it is, a, it is an activity more than just flying, more than just showing off. It's, it's a congenial type of meeting where you talk to your friends and wave your hand, tell lies to each other, like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like we say. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, thanks a lot, Harry, and look forward to seeing you again next year. Here it is, the Challenger, an Aristocraft high-tech digital proportional radio control system. One of the best values on the market. The Challenger transmitter is designed for ease of operation with a unique mar-resistant brushed gold finish. Some of the features on the transmitter are battery check button, RF output meter, elevator dual rate switch, and an elevator trim down mixing knob. As usually found in higher price transmitters, the Challenger's open gimbal design gives you stick tension and travel adjustments, and all pin connectors are of high quality construction. There is an easy access rear panel for servo reversing, mixing control adjustments, and dual rate travel adjustments. Change frequencies in a snap with pop-in modules. And the Challenger 620 system includes high torque indirect drive servos. The Challenger system complies with the 1991 narrowband standards. You can find one of the best values on the market at your local hobby shop. Each year, more people discover the greatest fun fly going, the Byron Originals Fun Fly in Ida Grove, Iowa. Here in Byron Godberson's backyard, we found 346 pilots, 450 giant scale airplanes, and around 12,000 spectators a day. People come from all over the United States and Canada to participate in this fantastic aviation event. What better place to show off your latest giant scale creation? The facilities are the finest available. 600 feet of smooth runway, or if you prefer, lots of wide open grass. Now, if you are considering making the worthwhile journey to Ida Grove, here's all you need. A monoplane with a wingspan of 80 inches or more, a biplane with a wingspan of 60 inches minimum, or a quarter scale of any size. Camping facilities are available with hot showers, no less. This is an event where you can't help but make new friends, and the whole family will enjoy the great show the Byron Original staff puts on.
In volume four of RC Video Magazine, we had the World War II reenactment. In this article, we are going to take a look at a cross-section of airplanes that show up and talk to some of the talented pilots at the flight line. My name is uh, Ken Kinchy from Madison, Wisconsin. Okay, and uh, can you tell us a little bit about your aircraft here? Yeah, it's a Byron Originals uh, Beechcraft, uh, Staggerwing Beechcraft. Uh, was, uh, uh, it has a fiberglass fuselage, uh, foam wings that are covered with the conocoat, and uh, the cowling and the fuselage are painted with uh, um, uh, KNB Super Poxy. What's it powered with? It's powered with a Quadro 35, a two, two cubic inch engine. Gasoline, uh, oil mix, uh, chainsaw engine is what it is. Got a retractable landing gear system. The main gear retracts and also the tail, tail wheel retracts. It has landing flaps and, uh, of course, ailerons and elevator and rudder. Did you use the Byron retract system? Yes, I did, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you, that's an air pressured retract system? Right, that's a pressure, air pressure. Uh, there's a pressure tank inside of the fuselage that uh, takes about, it'll take up to about 180 pounds, but I put in uh, oh, around 100 pounds of pressure. Um, how does it fly? It flies very well. It's a stable airplane. Uh, initially, I had the balance wrong on it. It was a little bit nose heavy, so I had a problem getting the tail down on landing, and I couldn't use the landing flaps at that point, but I've balanced it out since then, and uh, it flies very well, uh, with the exception of, uh, like the real aircraft, you bring them in too slow, the elevator uh, gets washed out by the wings, and you don't get an effective elevator, so it's difficult to get the tail down. Then. If you land it at a fairly good rate of speed, lands on the main gear, and then they, you can get the tail down with no problems. The spectators participated in a large drawing, and the winner won a ride in Hazel Sig's Cup. It's a lucky individual today to win the ride in the little quick wing Cup. Tom Tobarezzi is going to help Charlie there. He's going to get him strapped in there. We want him strapped in pretty good if we're going to give him a loop or two. He doesn't want this right there. We'll see what happens here. Oh, we that door up. Well, this is a nice speech, you know, we decided just to give away a ride, and Hazel donated her club, and it should work out very well. Okay. All right, Charlie, give him a good ride. Give him a loop or two or something. Hey, Tom, Tom, don't run off. I think we see a tail straight down there. You better get back there. Check that airplane. Something is right. Technical problem before takeoff. Some problem with the tail wheel. The pilot had to check.
if we can get those sheriff's people out there, we'll get him. Oh. Boy, don't you have that uh, machine here to use in the air show? Can't you shoot him down? We'll shoot him down and get this thing on. Get on with the air show here. Here he comes again. Just keep that thing away from the people. You got to land out here. Got to keep him waiting down. Watch him. Watch him. Turn. If you haven't already guessed, this is not a spectator, but a professional aerobatic pilot, Gene Susi, flying the famous Crazy Cub act. Boy, he is really out of control. That's it, Tommy, get him. We're talking with Dan Parsons. Dan, can you tell us a little bit about this aircraft? This is the the Havling Hornet, which uh, came out uh, near the end of World War II, did not get into World War II combat. It was designed by de Havilland and was a carry-on design past the Mosquito. I call the Hornet the uh, daughter of Mosquito. It was the very high-performance single-engine fighter designed to go for long range against the Japanese, hence the two engines, and, and it had extremely long range. Of course, the, it never got into combat, so they didn't use it for that, but it was very similar to the Mosquito in construction. It had a plywood, balsa plywood sandwich for the fuselage. Uh, the top of the wing uh, was plywood, but the bottom was metal. That's where it differed from the Mosquito. So it was, essentially, it has about the same wing plan form as Mosquito and very similar to it. In fact, a lot of people think it's a Mosquito because the Hornet's really not a very well-known airplane. Well, anyway, it was the fastest uh, piston prop fighter that ever went into production, 487 mile an hour on straight and level at 20,000. Uh, it had a 5,000 foot rate of climb at sea level. I, I wrote to, uh, to de Havilland in England, at that time they were Hawker Siddeley had taken over and, uh, and got factory drawings from them and then drew up my own plans from their drawings, uh, made my own uh, retracts and pulled my own canopy and I guess like I kiddingly say, I did everything but plant the tree down in Honduras, the balsa tree down in Honduras, you know. The model is, uh, weighs 14 pounds. I'm using two OS-61 FSRs. I have my own muffler system and exhaust system on it that uh, toned it down quite a bit. It was pretty loud when I had it just coming out, straight pipes coming out of the side of it. And let's see, it's a balsa construction throughout, built up wing and covered, of course, with uh, the uh, six-tenths ounce cloth that I sell. And, uh, I was just going to say, that's the glass that you distribute. Yeah, the glass cloth, and I use epoxy and sand it down and paint it with uh, auto acrylic lacquers. Singer Wallace, Christian Eagle, from Muscat, Texas. Singer Wallace, Christian Eagle, from Keep them up if you want to send them across. Like, I, mean, I do believe it is a snapper. Yeah. 
that's one way to keep the mosquitoes down. You know, you get these guys to smoke them. They help us out. Speaking with Ralph Brown, and we're going to find out about his beautiful GB here. Well, the GB is um, a 1932 racer that was uh, this particular airplane. Uh, so far as the history that I know, it was flown in uh, Omaha, Nebraska, in the women's air races uh, division in, uh, by a pilot by the name of Maude Tate. She was 23 years old at the time, and she won first place. I believe she died at the age of 81 uh, three or four years ago, uh, according to uh, Henry Hafke's uh, information, who is the uh, designer of the airplane. And I secured the plans from him in about 1980, had him sitting around for a couple of years, and then built the airplane, scratch built. Uh, it's all balsa wood. I, I monocoat all my airplanes and it has a 3.5 quadra engine it, in it. I've, uh, I've flown it about seven times, uh, one time today, and hopefully I get to fly it tomorrow. Japan. What are you doing here? I'm uh, trying to start a motor. Why? Well, I've got an airplane to crash. Okay, we'll be waiting for that. Good news from Byron Originals, Aviation Expo 87. Five full days of the world's most unique aviation event, August 12th through 16th.
when you demand high quality performance, use BK Products Blue Flame Fuels. BK Original Blue Flame Fuel is a blend of castor and synthetic oils with detergent and additives excellent for use in your model engine. BK Premium Gold Fuel contains space-age synthetic oils blended to give you the edge in performance, keeping four strokes running clean and smooth. The next time you're in Denver, visit the BK Hobby Center. Ask your local hobby dealer for BK Blue Flame Fuels.
In Volume 7, we will be taking you to the four-stroke rally in Riverside, California, the George Myers Memorial Fly-In near Denver, Colorado, where a beautiful solid silver trophy was given for craftsmanship. Volume 7 is well underway and looking great. We have some surprises for the sport flyer, so don't miss our next issue.